Hello and welcome to India Speak, the Center for Policy Research's podcast. This is the third of our four-part special series on India Civil Services with Dr. K. P. Krishnan. understanding its design its evolution over these last 75 years and through this locating the discourse on civil service reforms in the nature of the civil service and asking questions about what the future of reforming rejuvenating renewing the civil service would look like over the last uh, two series we've discussed the original design and dr krishnan walked us through how the civil services was envisaged at the time of our independence a founding moment how sardar patel anticipated the role of the civil services and structured its design around that one particularly important point that uh, he highlighted in that conversation was that the civil services played the role not just of being in, in independent india an administrator but also being the agent of social change and therefore several aspects of the civil service design its elite character its distance from the grassroots at some level as a consequence of its elite character the center state dynamic were all structured within this understanding of the particular purpose the civil services had in our second conversation we talked about the changes that that took place over the unfolding of these last 75 years some of these changes were explicit were carefully thought through as part of uh, aligning the civil services towards the agenda of social change as a as a democracy matured and some were changes uh, that took place perhaps without design but i- implicitly nonetheless as part and parcel of the shifts that india was undergoing as economic and social progress took place and as democracy became more embedded in our social and political structure but for all these changes the civil services have also been both in public imagination and in policy discourse at the heart of many of the problems that ail governance in contemporary india and it isn't uncommon to constantly hear the refrain the indian state wants to do many things but it's unable to because of its low capacity bureaucracy at the heart of this challenge is the need to rethink the framework of our steel frame this is what we will discuss in our concluding two episodes we will in this episode focus on the economic changes that india has undergone and what this means for the direction of civil service reforms and in our last episode we will talk about the dynamics of democracy and bureaucracy and how these dynamics should shape the discourse on civil service reforms dr krishnan let me start by asking you to give us the frame of reference within which this discourse of reforms has taken place it's been a long standing discussion if we go back even to the 1960s the first administrative reforms commission were, has a history so for, uh, and in fact i was reading some of nehru's early letters to the chief ministers where he laments the civil services and much of what he says about the ias would ring true even today he talks about how it was designed for a very different kind of purpose he talks about its distance from people as being a problem even though as you told us it was also part and parcel of the nature of its design he talks about red tape he talks about corruption cut to 2022 we are still having the same conversation and in, interlaced within this conversation <clears throat> have been periods of of discussion about the framework of bureaucratic reform so could you just give us an overview of the of this framework uh, and your thoughts on what would be the directions in which we need to think when we talk about reforming civil services thanks yamini when we talk about civil service reforms uh, i think you're right when you say that it's not a stand alone conversation it needs to be part of a i think a, a larger a sort of more deeper conversation of governance reforms mm-hmm. and i think the sort of the best way uh, i can uh, think about this is there were a certain set of design features that were sort of inherently necessary for 
a neutral and a, you know neutral in the westminster democracy style civil service we are not a, a the american style uh, whatever is called the spoils system where you have a formal sort of uh, ability to bring in people of your particular uh, political persuasion etc etc for the duration of your office the formal design of the indian civil service so i said has some original design features which continue to be relevant so i think the way i would approach this is look at the india of today for instance we did not have the 73rd and the 74th amendment in place when a lot of the original design was done now if we need to move towards a much more decentralized form of governance then clearly the civil service needs to be modified in its essential character in its design its structure to be able to support that i am i am uh, sort of uh, i am reminded of the difficulties that mr ramkrishna hegde had in the first few years of the karnataka zilla panchayat act if you recall abdul nazir saab a very respected uh, revenue uh, sorry uh, rural development minister of karnataka and uh, the then cm of karnataka mr ramkrishna hegde had brought about this revolutionary change in the way the district government functions by actually bringing together all of the development functions under an elected zilla panchayat with enormous powers almost matching the powers of the state government now it meant centralization it meant coordination it also meant for instance ability to reallocate money to be more suitable for a district uh, which may not be relevant for b district now that setup required a chief executive officer of the zilla panchayat at that time very imaginatively called chief secretary of the zilla panchayat to be working under an elected president of the zilla panchayat the civil service quietly but strongly resisted this move and you know they have diluted a lot of the zilla panchayat powers they have increased the powers of the ceo the person has been renamed from cs to ceo now i think this uh, struggle was because the ias has not internalized the idea that you could be working under a political executive other than at the national and the state level now i think this is imperative not necessarily exactly the karnataka model but something of that kind because that is exactly what the constitution now formally envisages mm -hmm. likewise you will have urban uh, bodies where you will have ceos the equivalent of uh, ceos of the zp who would again be reporting to an elected political body and this ability to work with local politicians and be able to do effective delivery of local public goods is i think an important requirement this is clearly not part of the original design i can go on i can give you one more example for instance the entire rise of the regulatory state the post 91 uh, uh, rise of bodies like the securities exchange board of india irda the insurance regulatory development authority india these you know some of us may think that okay these are specialized functions far away from the routine functions the ias and you would not be incorrect but what about real estate regulator what about the electricity regulator what about the food safety standards regulator now these are all functions where a lot of the ias will have good serious domain competence but the role of that regulator is very different 
from the role of the executive government can the present ias discharge those functions or should we think of some mechanism by which some part of the ias opts and goes into the regulatory apparatus not to come back to government to preserve independence this is a point of view so i think the short point is the india of today has evolved very uh, sort of hugely from the india of 1947 or 50 when a lot of this apparatus was designed so my sense would be we look at the requirements of the india of today the governance requirements the developmental requirements the language requirements the ability and then be able to design the civil service that india needs for today and i expect the outcome will be retention of some of the original design features modification of some features so as to be able to answer today's requirement thank you i think you raise a very important point that the starting point of uh, a discourse on reform cannot be what ails the current system it has to be what is the role of the state in a in the present or contemporary moment and the kinds of uh, functions that it has to un, uh, it has to do but in some ways isn't that it's not been articulated as such but in the public imagination one of the first complaints that is made especially of the bureaucracy of the ias in the context of uh, liberalization and the contemporary economy is that as the economy has got more complex this generalist view of bureaucracy or administration no longer applies therefore we need to do lateral entry so it's not like the changing nature of the role of the state in a in, in a changing economy and society hasn't been at the center of some of this discussion even though it may not always be articulated as such But but the first key point uh is is the first step of that change therefore about changing the nature of the skill sets that we need do we really need specialists and do these specialists necessarily have to come from outside because the original design as you had told us was about capturing the young idealist administrator who's who would start at the district uh with the ambition of uh you know engineering social change and move up into the domain of policy and uh and and governance and administration so tell us a little bit about where you fall on these arguments uh, you are right fundamentally the changing role of the state and the new role of the state and the new demands on the state i think should be the starting point of the conversation clearly what ails the civil service as it stood even in the old sort of paradigm is of relevance but the solutions would need to be a combination of what ailed it and what is required number 1 number 2 uh, on the sort of this uh, young civil servant climbing up the hierarchy and being able to discharge uh, functions at the state level and then subsequently at the union level etc as opposed to the lateral entry i would actually put it slightly differently i don't think it's either or mm -hmm. i think there is a role for both now let's take live examples you're familiar and and i'll go back to the sectors that i'm most familiar with and it's not to say that this is the only area where this has happened mm -hmm. i'm going back to this sector because i know it best mm -hmm. you remember the fundamental changes in the securities market regulation mm -hmm. that came about post 9192 mm -hmm. when uh, india decided to do away with an institution called the controller of capital issues mm -hmm. and created a regulator called sebi securities exchange board of india a very different organization of state than any that we had known till then because this was an organization that is going to be exercising executive quasi judicial and quasi legislative powers that's not very material to what i'm saying but it required a bunch of institutions 
to be able to create a modern ecosystem for the equities market in India. Mm -hmm. One such institution was something called a depository, mm -hmm. which is the entity which keeps ownership records of corporates. Now, you're familiar with registrar of companies and that whole mechanism where if you had a million shareholders, you actually had a million pieces of paper. The depository system would also be a marriage of the newly available technology, doing all of this electronically, using the most modern uh, telecommunication transmission, etc., etc. So India required a new, complete new ecosystem to be able to bring this about. We wrote a legislation which is considered one of our finest pieces of legislation in, in modern times. It's called the Depositories Act. The Depositories Act was largely written by an IAS officer, a gentleman called Dr. P.J. Nayak. Mm -hmm. He was a celebrated officer of Carter. He, besides being an IAS officer, is also a extremely well-trained Cambridge mathematician who had spent enormous amount of time in the financial sector. So after having been correct uh, land development bank and all of the conventional postings of the IAS in the state, and all of which he discharged extremely well, as Joint Secretary Capital Markets, literally on you know the in the last month of his tenure in Delhi, he single-handedly with the support of Dr. M. S. Sahu, mm -hmm. subsequently uh, became chairman IBBI and all. He and a third person, T. K. Vishwanathan, who was then a direct in a space of 20 days. That legislation, I, I would urge you to take a look at it, stands unamended by and large today, and it's been able to handle everything that we've done in this modern era of electronic markets. Now, he was not a market expert. In fact, I because India decided to do this against the advice of every expert. No other country in the world had even tried this. So we created a national stock exchange, which was entirely electronic from day one. Mm -hmm. We created a depository system, which is now the world's largest depository. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these were brought about by this gentleman, but working under an expert who had come from the outside, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. Mm. And it worked extremely well. Mm. So I do not believe it's either or. I think all systems require external expertise. They also require enormous amount of internal expertise as in mm. Dr. Naik knew how to pilot a legislation through government of India and parliament. Now, we often trivialize this knowledge. This knowledge is also a specialist knowledge. Now, the person who may know the workings of depositories may know nothing about how is consultation carried out in government of India. And you can say, no, no, this is something one can learn in a day. But you can learn about depositories in a day. Mm -hmm. So I think the eventual answer, I've taken the best example. I'm sure you can quote me five examples where okay. a similar uh, you know, thing worked. And I can give you 10 examples of a similar thing that did not work. Mm -hmm. So my limited point would be, we would need a combination of this. There would be IAS officers who may be domain experts in some chosen fields. And there will be IAS officers who may not be domain experts, who will continue to be important for a whole bunch of governance related functions. And even in those old governance related functions, for instance, take the Ministry of Home Affairs. It discharges perhaps the oldest sovereign function, security of the state. Mm. But the security of the state today may involve such in-depth knowledge of cyber security that you may need that youngster on the road who may not be formally trained, but who is perhaps an expert hacker. And we keep you know, coming across such kids. Now, we have to figure out a way of inducting that kind of talent into the public system. So I think the challenge is uh, 
combination of expertise that are required in government, which could come from a multitude of sources, some from the IAS, some from central services, some from the outside, but I don't think it's either of. That makes sense. I hear you uh, because I do also believe that uh, the either or arguments often tend to go down the road of extreme simplicity. Uh, but if we were to stay with that, that it's a combination of things, um, a related question, and I, it's come up in the course of our conversation over the last two episodes as well, is in the current design structure. We seem to be able to effectively build administrative expertise because that design from district onwards sort of still stays, there's some sanctity to that. But we are not necessarily able to build domain expertise. Is this a challenge within the IAS for you to reflect on that question? But And if that is so... Uh, as part of thinking about reform, rather than saying we need outside expertise inside, uh, do we also need to think better about how we channelize expertise? Because one day you can be Secretary of Rural Development, next day you can be like, let's look at your own career. You were in finance ministry, you went to land, you went to skills before you retired. Right. So you, these are in some ways related but also very specialized things and you spend periods of time in each three. So is it, do we need to think about that aspect of the movement across uh, administrative responsibilities and the need to build domain expertise somewhat differently for the IAS? Yes, actually, that's a difficult question. And it's, it's a difficult challenge because I think the IAS has this very uh, sort of ambivalent position on this question because if we begin to argue the specialist case seriously, mm -hmm. then the argument very often will be, why is the Indian Economic Service not the appropriate service for the insider specialist? Mm -hmm. And likewise, the Indian Telecom Service or you know a, a bunch of other central services available to the government of India who are expected to be domain uh, sort of specialists in the chosen area. But I think the problem there is if the IAS can get fossilized, so can the other services. Mm. And in reality, I have seen that the expert services have as much incentive, if anything, even lesser incentive than the IAS to keep up with the latest. So if in the governmental system, there is no incentive, there is no pressure, there is no demand on you to be up to date with current knowledge, it's then left to the individual the individual IES officer or the individual telecom officer or individual IAS officer to keep up with his or her chosen field. So I think there is this one basic problem of how do we incentivize permanent civil service to continue to invest in itself, to be able to constantly update, to be able to constantly keep pace with current developments in their respective domains. Having said that, there is, I think, merit in allowing this post-20, and, and this is an experiment which has been tried in the past, you allow, there is a standard career of an IAS officer, which typically will be up to the first 15 years or so, because that's more or less common across India. And a lot of those functions, I suspect, will continue to remain for the next 50 years at least. We will need to continue to administer geographical regions, uh, which are subdivisions, which are districts, which are divisions. And they will need generalist officers who will head these regions. Plus, there will be a whole bunch of functions, both at the union, at the state level, which are, quote unquote, general administrative governance functions. In addition, there will be a whole bunch of functions, civil aviation, uh, you know, petroleum or uh, Ministry of Finance, banking, where you will need 
domain expertise of a minimal kind which will never be equivalent to the best domain expert on that subject at that point in time in the market for instance a viral acharya or a raghuram rajan who are professors of banking and who are also serious practitioners because in the us system they are not only teaching they are active on boards they give testimony before congress they take sabbaticals and work outside so they are experts in a very gen, you know very sort of serious sense on their domains that kind of expertise i don't think any permanent civil servant sitting inside the government will ever acquire so the insider who chooses to be a domain expert i think will have to be carefully designed because there will be the tendency for a number of people to opt for coat and coat the relatively more glamorous sectors mm -hmm. uh, glamorous from a you know variety of point of view you know potential job opportunities in international organizations uh, uh, ability to go and give uh, you know lectures consultancies a whole lot of things that you understand but there are a whole bunch of other sectors which are critical for india mm -hmm. uh internal uh, for instance we have a serious uh let's say problem of extremism in parts of india mm. that is also a specialist job to be able to understand what's going on in some of the left extremism areas in some of the uh, northeast or other border areas where there are problems of a you know apparent law and order kind but much deeper problems there are people who need to specialize in these mm. so the dilemma that i have seen governments face the government's priorities may be a b and c mm. and these are truly national priorities the individuals career priorities may be e f and g now these may not meet and hence you have this problem of the government wanting to pick the best person for jobs in a b and c may just go and pick a person who has spent 27 years in finance or in agriculture because currently law and order has become a problem or conducting census has become a problem so i, I think to some extent this problem will persist but as a way forward my suggestion would be that after the 20th year approximately we should allow people to specialize but that decision should not be entirely that of the individual it has to be a marriage of the individual's interest the individual's abilities has the individual put time and effort in actually becoming an expert and some sense of government priorities because unlike any other job there is a public interest element here and i think the demands of the system cannot be ignored but i think to bring objectivity one would need to think of a mechanism like upsc involve the individual involve the state government involve the government of india and an expert body like upsc to begin the first steps in specialization mm. and this is not to say these are the only experts who will populate government clearly you will need experts beyond these and some of these can also then become the specialist cadres for the now emerging regulatory state correct so these are the first sort of part incoherent part incoherent thoughts on future uh, sort of movement in this regard no that's really uh, very valuable because i think you've given us a new way of uh, framing this whole question of generalist versus specialist and lateral entry private sector coming in versus not after all we celebrated i remember very clearly um uh, that when nandan nilakani came to the uidi uh, there were all these photographs in the newspapers of him uh, you know you walk into a bureaucrat's office the standard thing you see is the towel on the chair um and anyone who's been in districts in india knows why the towel is there but uh, when you come into the fancy offices in delhi you don't in private sector expect to see towels but lo and behold they are there and nandan very symbolically 
picked up the towel and moved it aside as he was sitting down on his chair. That was a photograph. And this is widely celebrated as, you know, private sector coming in um, but and, and a new ethos entering. But you mentioned a very important thing that I think we miss out in these discussions, which is that there is a public interest element of centrality of value systems of public interest that is at the heart of what the civil service should embody and how the civil service should imagine its role in uh, administering and serving uh, the country. And I don't know that we value this enough in our discourse on the complexities of the economy and the relationship of what is good about private sector and its culture and values entering into what makes for the civil services. Um, we've spoken a lot about the shifting dynamics of the economy and the kind of specialized needs it places on civil service and, and some thinking of yours on where to go. In our next episode, we will talk about civil service reforms from the perspective of the unfolding dynamics of the relationship between democracy and the bureaucracy and how the nature of democracy itself is ought to shape the path forward for bureaucratic reforms. Thank you for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and on our website www.cprindia.org.